Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast, where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Leave us your likes and comments. You can also leave likes and comments on our Facebook page. Follow us on iTunes and Spotify and check out our website, www.talklouderpodcast.com. I'm Metal Dave Glessner, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster, and we've got a guest today who spent a number of weeks in 1998 at the top of the charts in several countries. Uh, that guy is Tony Scalzo from the band Fastball, based right here in Austin, Texas. Uh, so Jason and Tony have a bit of a history together. I'm very familiar with Tony, obviously. Um, so kind of a local boy made good in, in a big way there for a period of time in the late 90s. We'll talk to him in just a moment. But I want to take a minute to give a shout out to our friend Patrick Kennison, who was our very first guest on the Talk Louder podcast. Pat is the guitar player and lead of Ford's band. I'd like to thank him and David Castillo for putting me on the guest list and taking care of my family at the Lita Ford show in Houston this past weekend. My son got his very first backstage pass and my yes. son is 13 years old and he's very excited to have his very first backstage. I pass. know when I was 13, I, knew, <laughs> I didn't have any backstage passes. I didn't either, but yeah. <laughs> well, he's go. got, he's got his first and he sees my collection around the house. They're all hanging on the wall and he loves the stories behind every one of them. So now he's starting his new chapter. Thanks to Patrick Kennison and uh, David Castillo. Tell us about the show real quick. It was great, man. Uh, the bill, the entire bill was Bullet Boys were on first. It was actually the original band. They, they managed to pull all the original members wow. together. So Bullet Boys kicked it off. Lita Ford was in the middle and Warrant was the headliner. And uh, Eddie Trunk was hosting the show. So he was kind of doing the intros of the bands, you know, and milling about the place. And I spent a good bit of the night hanging out with uh, our friend Donnie Van Stavern. Uh, who people will probably remember from Riot, uh, S.A. Slayer. He's in one of, he was in one of your bands, Evil United. We talked extensively about that Evil United record, Honored by Fire, because my son loves it. And so when I told my son that this guy that I'm talking to is the bass player on that record, they kind of hit it off too. Everybody was so gracious. Uh, Mick Sweeta from the Bullet Boys came up to us uh, at one point and said hello. He went backstage and got my son a guitar pick. I mean, everybody was just super gracious to me and my family, and we had a great time, and I just wanted to give uh, a shout to to Patrick, Lita, and David awesome. Castillo. Thank you all very much. Awesome. And with that, we should get into Tony Scalzo. Let's talk to him. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Tony Scalzo joining us today. Tony, of course, uh, best known as the bass player, singer, songwriter for Hi, Fastball. Tony. Hi. <laughs> Hi, guys. Jason's playing with his... Uh, I'm his playing with my... Put a word in there. <laughs> All right. Especially Pets. How you doing, Tony? I'm good. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. We've uh, we got a lot to talk about. Um, for for those who don't know, Tony uh, is a primary songwriter, a co song uh, songwriter, I guess, with with uh, your bandmate Miles Zuniga in uh, Fastball. Now that um, name you got you got wrong. Zuniga. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. Before we before we started taping, I asked Tony how to pronounce his last name because I wanted to make sure I didn't screw it you up. Got right, you got that right. It's it's Zuniga, like. Informally, I guess his family name is Zuniega, right? But okay. it's I'm going to call him Miles. Miles works perfect. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you and Miles, along with Joey Shuffield, uh, did I get that one right? Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> uh, along with Joey, uh, your drummer Joey is uh, comprised of the trio known as Fastball, based out of Austin, Texas. And uh, in yeah. 1998, you guys were on top of the world. I mean, you had a massive hit single, a song called The Way, went to number one on the American charts and stayed there for seven weeks. And I know it reached number one in Canada and it was a top 10 hit in multiple countries around the world. Yeah. Um, it was man. a good hit to go to those places. 
I'm sorry. It, it was a great ticket to be able to, you know, travel around the world and just yeah, staying and what an education. Give it, give us a sense of what something like that does to your life. Because one minute you're working a day job, you're playing the local club circuit, and I don't, I don't mean to make it sound like it was overnight, but then you go from that to having a number right. one hit single that's on the radio constantly everywhere around the world, and all of a sudden your life starts going a million miles an hour. I would imagine. So give us a sense of what it seems like a total shock to the system. Can you kind of? Can you sort of describe that whole rocket ride? That's a really accurate. Um, it's so accurate that I'm just going to leave it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it. It was definitely a, a change of pace um, because like we've been working really hard in a van and, and touring the country and playing really small places to like very strange bills with all manner of genre of bands, you know, um, Everything from, you know, like really hard metal, like in places like Longview, Texas, or maybe down in Corpus, there was a lot of a lot of hard rock in the South and a lot of uh, alternative music in the Midwest. And, um, you know, every town sort of had its scene. So you would be on these bills with local bands and you'd get a little education about you know, what was happening in those areas of the country. So, I mean, it was all pretty, pretty um, hard work, but it was fun and there was no real money and you had to like, you know, double up in a hotel and, and try to, you know, just, you know, make the best of it and come home. And I came home and I still had to work at the bagel manufacturer on the drag. And um, uh, once I got back from whatever tour we were doing and, um, yeah, we were on a major label, but the record that we put out as a debut was called Make Your Mama Proud. That was in 95. Um, it didn't sell like anything. I mean, it was like just a total flop. Was that on uh, Hollywood? Yeah, that was on Hollywood. Oh, was correct. it? Yeah. But, um, you know, we were like, well, it's not really selling. And we would manage to go and do radio here and there. And we had decent management and they were trying to, you know, work it as best we could. And then we we're trying to hopefully get another record out on Hollywood before, you know, before they would give up or we would give up, give up. I mean, just, we, we, it was up in the air. We didn't know what was going to happen. So we're home for a while. And then we decide we're going to try and make another record. We're going to make a second record. Meanwhile, there's a couple of shows here and there in town, maybe, Dallas was a regular haunt, Deep Ellum and, and San Antonio, we play it like, um, well, you got a Sons of Hercules thing. There was a club called the Green Door that we used to play at down there and we play Taco Land and stuff like that. And, you know, we're just hustling and trying to make, trying to make stuff happen. Um, but we, we, we went out to Hollywood and we did another record. And this time the label was all shook up and they had like, no, no president. And A&R was just like a bunch of people going, what are you working on? What are you working on? And they just like, cool, man. Nobody knew it was going to happen, you know? And then we managed to get in there and make this record and spent a bunch of label money and made this record and put these songs on it. And right at that time when we were about to put it out, <clears throat> it was, you know, spring of 98. Boom. Here comes... Bob Cavallo, manager of Green Day, and I mean Goo Goo Dolls, and not Green Day, but Goo Goo Dolls, and you know all these different people, famous dude, high powered, uh, becomes president of Hollywood Records. Um, they decide they like this song the way is, is for whatever reason. Miles has a more accurate, you know, memory of it, but I'll, all I know is this song was going to get worked and it was getting a little bit of action on my like college radio and alternative radio in weird little places like Birmingham or Sacramento or, or whatever, you know, and he saw that as an indicator that it was going to blow up and he'd been working with the Goo Goo Dolls. So he knew that an alternative band could, you know, dominate the charts if, 
you know, they just did put the right people on it and got the right radio action. And that's exactly what they have. So all these people, that's what they did. So all these people started coming from different places to work the record and mainly radio type stuff. So we went from <clears throat> sitting around waiting for the record to, to, to like wonder when it's going to come out, you know, and not really doing a ton of stuff to all of a sudden we're doing all the setup work. Jason may be familiar with that kind of thing when you're getting ready to set up an album and you got to go do all these things. You got to go visit the distributors. You got to go visit the radio stations and then tons of, uh, you know, like press, paper type stuff, you know, you know Rolling Stone or whatever. Yeah. Anything she, that you could do, we would do because Hollywood hands, had to get Shaking hands and kissing oh. babies. I'm sorry, Jason. What'd you say? Shaking hands and kissing babies. Yeah. Well, yeah. And actually kissing, kissing the hands of <laughs> the people who worked at these places, not knowing. I didn't know what the hell was going on, man. I was so out of my element. And I heard radio promo guys like, like in the front seat while I'm in the back seat and they're taking me to some dinner and they're just laughing and they're laughing and they're, they'd ask me a question and I'd say something and they'd just laugh look at each other and i felt like a total ass like freaky scene like it's this is weird and i'm really taken for a ride they're, they're not literally. your yeah they're not they're not really your people <laughs> oh they are not my people they're they're I, even today it's hard to i mean as as much as some of those people are in my life still and they're they're cool. I mean, but you know, they don't know what the hell I'm thinking about. Ever. It's like it's like being driven around by Silvio and Big Pussy in the Sopranos. <laughs> well, it's not far from that, really. It's not yeah. far from yeah. that. You get in the car in Detroit, and then they go, "Hey, man, we're going to go to Windsor. My cousin has a restaurant, and we're going to Canada now." And you're like, "Okay." So you're at this restaurant for three and a half hours, and. You know, it's it's crazy. It's just crazy. Well, so did, yeah, did and then we start moving, and then we get on on the radio. Radio starts playing it huge. Right? Yeah, we're in LA, we're getting ready to do a couple of like uh, showcase type things, you know. But then I'm on the 134, and I'm going by this giant mural of Madonna, right? Because it's a uh, it's a uh, ray of light. It's around that time, and she's all like you know, this giant thing. And I see her and then I hear, and I hear the way on the radio on K-Rock and it's 4.30, baby. It's yeah. 4.30 PM. It's like prime time. Off. It's on. And we, we were freaking out like happy. And then, you know, it's still, it's so weird. You expect like the big bag of money to just drop down and <laughs> you're like, when's that happening now? Cause <laughs> And then, then you get a little money. You don't have any time to do any thinking about what you're going to do with a little bit of money. You don't know what, because you're busy as hell. Yeah. In the yeah. radio, at three in the morning, two in the in lunch. And then like later, you got to go play sound check. Then you got to go do something else. You got a dinner and then you're going to go play your show. And that's in every city you go to. And what makes it even more surreal is you're opening up for someone who doesn't have a hit on the radio. You know, yeah. you're, we were opening up for Whiskey Town, which was Ryan Adams' band at the yeah. time. Yeah. And they had a bus, and we're following them around in our Econo line with a trailer, loading in, loading out our own stuff, and still doing that. Meanwhile, the song's on the, on the radio, like, every 10 minutes. Wow. And, you know, we would be parked out in front of the club, behind the bus, and the people would like swarm the bus thinking that it was us <laughs> we're, we're behind the bus. And, and I don't think Ryan Adams thought that was really that great. And I think he wanted us off the tour pretty quick. And, but, you know, it worked out. We ended up being friends with all of them. And, I uh, feel like, uh, I feel like you were working on, and this sounds kind of gangster here. You were working on, uh, garnering a following that might have, you know, already been a Ryan fan that were coming a fastball fan. 
Yeah. And that's uh, that's kind of the, the 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 battle you are, the war. It, you call it whatever you want, but that's that's kind of what you were doing. As soon as the audience who's standing around waiting for uh, Ryan to play, here's the way. Oh, that's this band. I hear this song on the radio all the time. That's right. you guys. And so they're that, putting it all that together. Still happens. That yeah. thing. Oh, I bet. That phenomenon. I yeah. they go, oh, hey. We, we, uh, we recently had uh, David Roach on the show, a singer for Junkyard, and he was talking about um, the Black Crows were the opening act for Junkyard um, mm. when they went out on their first national tour. And during the tour, the Black Crows started to take off. So there was a point somewhere about in the middle of the leg where Black Crows was probably the more popular band, certainly the band that was on the radio more often. Right. So I know what you're saying. You got, you know, your star is starting to rise when as you're an opening act and somewhere in that transition, you become the bigger name. Yeah. So, yeah. so your album, your album came out, All the Pain Money Can Buy, Right there, folks. That's, uh, yeah, spring of 98. 98. So six months, I think it was six months after its release, it was already platinum. Is that right? Yeah, more like three or four. Yeah, three or four months. You sold a million copies of this album. Yeah, by summer, I was in Canada and I was at um, Music Plus, Much Music in Montreal, which is like the Canadian MTV and... They had us on a camera interviewing us and they handed us platinum and or gold and platinum, which is like wow. apparently doesn't take very was much. That the, was that your Canada? 10% of what it takes to get an American. Yeah. 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 Smaller numbers. Right. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but still, I mean, that that's an incredible feat. And, and a lot of that has to do with the single, The Way. It was a huge hit single and it helped propel the, the sales of that album. Uh, but man, that is that's like whiplash. You you're going you're you just went supersonic in the space of about four to six months or something. Yeah, and then it's time to go to Europe and then it's time to go to um, Japan. Yeah. And I think we were gone for like like three years. Yeah, that's crazy. What did, I don't, I, and we're in Austin and people are like, man, you guys, I'm glad you came out to Austin. That's that's awesome. So what's it like in L.A.? <laughs> you know, like they thought we were from L.A. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a that's a I, I came to find that, you know, even though in our video it has a Texas flag everywhere and everyone in the band has a fucking Texas tattoo. They assumed you're from Hollywood. And in there going, yeah, man, so are you guys heading back out to Hollywood? No, <laughs> yeah. right here. <laughs> Tony, I don't I don't know if you'll remember this, but at some point um, I interviewed you guys backstage during sound check at the Austin Music Hall. You were on tour with Everclear at the time. Right. And uh, I was back there interviewing you guys. I think I was writing for the San Antonio Express News at that time because you guys were a big big deal and so uh they wanted the story you know and i'm interviewing you and i remember at the time this is where i got a a firsthand glimpse of what uh what a rat race a tour must be like for somebody um at the time your wife pulled up in a car and opened the hatchback and you were literally trading out old supplies for fresh supplies. It was like, here's the dirty laundry. And then you picked up the clean laundry and then oh you, handed, God, really? you, you handed yeah. over some roller skates or roller blades or something. Right. You're like I'm not I able to use these. Blades. You take them. And I'm just That's watching. Crazy. Do you remember this? I don't remember, but it sounds totally accurate. It sounds like something that would happen. It's like, hi, how you doing? Well, here's the laundry. Here's yeah. your laundry. We were You're like, there and we would literally split to another place. Right. Like, you, we're you, leaving tonight for, you know. Yeah. You were, you were literally in the middle of a tour and you're like, thank God I'm home for, you know, 12 hours or whatever it might right. be. And you're swapping out laundry and you're swapping out books and just stuff to keep you occupied on the road. And I was standing right there just watching this shift. And I thought, wow, man, that's when I got an appreciation for what, uh, what a treat it must be for you guys. Jason knows this, you know, you come home 
And even though you're home for 12 hours, you get to sleep in your own bed and maybe, you know, make a meal in your own kitchen or, or something like that. Just that rare glimpse of normalcy. Yeah, that's a, that's a long time ago. And I'm a different, I'm a different person today. Um, I still am the same musician and I do all that stuff the same, but I don't really remember a ton of, of all that. And that marriage, you know, there's a new marriage and then there's like new kids and that the, 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 the what you describe actually hurt my personal life pretty bad. It was like, this is, I can't, how you even maintain a relationship when you're gone? Yeah. Or like going, I mean, it might as well be me in a war or me be in prison or me be a rock star out on the road. It's like to, to them, you know, I'm just absent. And that's no way to, to, it's in my opinion, I mean, other people have done it, you know, but yeah. that's no way to keep a family happening. It takes a toll, I'm sure. I mean, that's yeah, uh, harsh, hardcore, real lessons. Yeah, that, that have made me a, a different person today. And now I'm a little bit less, you know, I'm I'm less impressed by just about everything. That's yeah. good. <laughs> it's a good. Nervous. Yeah. And, uh, really successful people. I'm cool with as long as they're, you know, they act like real people. Yeah. Uh, as far as the fame thing, I'm like, talk about, talk about a drug, talk about, you know, you can't even figure out who, who likes you for, for one reason or another, you know, it's like, how do you figure that out? Right. So, <laughs> these days I keep things really simple and it's not hard because I'm 57 and I, you know, I have a great family and I still have uh, a little, a little one, my son, my latest kid is nine. And, um, you know, I'm able to do a lot and I regret, you know, some of the absences, you know, with the former, with the, you know, the older kids, but this time around, you know, and especially with the pandemic, it's been like, yeah, we're, we're, we're attached at the hip. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Literally in the next room right well, now. Do you, do you feel like you've been able to, to catch up with your older kids a little bit? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That is great. That is great. Yeah, um, they're all grown up, you know, they're all like, uh, I have one in college, he's at St. Ed's, and I have Ooh. another who is 22, and uh, she and I, um, we get along really great, we just like, you know, like a lot of the same things, turn each other on to music, and um, and then my 28-year-old daughter is doing great, she works for the state, and, and then Henry here, he's taking piano and doing good in school and just a fun, fun awesome. kid. Hey, I want to so. ask, I want to jump around a little bit. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people, you know, who, especially a lot of people who, you know, are fans of this show are, are more on the, the heavier, darker side of metal. And they, they, mm -hmm. you know, the people who really like the show and comment, I mean, I know they like, you know, Tom Petty and whatever, but you know, yeah, I mean, but, there's but, obviously they're, a but then they're going to, yeah, but then they're going to turn especially on, especially with me, it's easy. Cause yeah, but then they're going to turn on motorhead or Slayer or something right sure. after that. But you know, I want people to know, because I know this about you, that you, you know, used to play punk bands, play in punk bands. And, and I don't know if you've ever been in like a metal band. Why don't you give us like your, your, you were born in Hawaii. And right. when you, when you were moving around a lot, uh, and I'm guessing it was more or less in the States that you were kind of yeah. around. Okay. Yeah. My dad was in the Marine Corps. Yeah. So I, we did move around a lot when I was little, but we, we settled in Orange County, California um, by the time I was like eight. Okay. So from eight to about 28. Oh, shit. I, I lived in, I lived in Southern California. So you were picking up in the eighties, you were picking up a lot of heavy metal. In the seventies, dude. Yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, man, 
I would love to see a movie and, and the closest thing I can get to a movie of where, what it was like growing up where I grew up was that movie over the edge. Yeah. You ever seen that with yeah. Matt, Matt Dillon and yeah, it's an insane movie where the kids live in the stupid suburb and the parents are like, it's all developed and it's all, and I see it all over the country today. Yeah. And there's going to be kids who are going to be like, you know, this is bullshit. Yeah. And that's what that movie was like. And that's what our neighborhood was like. And it was mainly just anything that would piss off our parents. And <laughs> so the first thing there was, was like the drag strip down the road and you could see bands play. And those bands usually, they, they were either fifties rock and roll, which was cool. There's nothing, nothing wrong with no, a little too scary. And then there was like um, these new kind of, Oh, you couldn't even, there was no word heavy metal. Right. There was no metal. Right. It was just hard rock or whatever. It's hard right. rock. So there was this band called Spectrum. And in I my think, neighborhood, I think, in had a, I think we had a Spectrum down in Corpus too. I'm sure there's a bunch of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They had this guy who could just do, and he had long curly blonde hair and he could just do the robber plant thing perfect. And nice. they would play like, Ted Nugent, Hey Baby, and they'd play like Whole Lot of Love and UFO and shit yeah. like that. So, I mean, for me, there was no, and there was nothing that we liked the stuff that wasn't on the radio, really. Yeah, deep. And uh, I'm sorry to say, but even in Southern California, you couldn't hear Lights Out and you couldn't hear like, you couldn't hear a Never Say Die, even though it was like the latest Black Sabbath record. Right. You couldn't hear anything. No Judas Priest. There was nothing. They were a band. Scorpions were a band. All those bands were bands, but there was nothing happening like that on the radio. All, it was still all of those bands were right in the middle of their their cream, their 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 most star yeah. moments. And, uh, and I gotta say that's sort of the aesthetic that I ended up on for a long time. And it's like at the heart of my musical influence is really those years, mm -hmm. I would say between 75 and 80. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes, that includes bands like, you know, even like, uh, like um, Bruce Springsteen and, you know, more uh, Heartland sort of, uh, yeah. I don't know, a vibe. Cause I had a cousin who lived in New Jersey and, and she moved in with us and she said, she says, what? You haven't heard of the boss? You're a loser. And she's like, <laughs> you know, giving me these records to, to check out. And she turned me on to the first Aerosmith record. Oh, cool. Yeah. She blew my doors off. I was like, this record rules. Yeah. Um, the one with Dream On and, you know, Mama Can and all that sure. stuff. Yeah. yeah. And Thank I just kind of like that. It, it was rock and roll played in a, in a, in a naturally evolved way. It wasn't like we're trying to like uh, smash the castle and you know steal all the curtains and the, and build our own thing. It was like it was a sort of organic way. Yeah. And yeah, there was punk happening, but you know, let's face it, it ha really has nothing nothing to do with the musicians who 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 like made these forms and made these musics. It has more to do with the press. And the media and how they want to, and the marketing at record labels yeah. and how they want to, you know, brand it and how they want to put the yeah. label on Everything it. ends up in a box. They put something in a box yeah. so they can. Yeah, and it's it. dumb. I, I hate oh, that. That's, that's over on aisle seven. You <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I worked in record stores for years, too. I didn't work in the chains. I worked in, um, in used record stores in Southern California. I was... You know, and I got into a lot of, I mean. Any, any ones that we might have heard of? Maybe. Uh, I worked in a place called um, Second Time Around Records on Melrose in Hollywood. Um, and that would be from about 80, no, about 90 to 91. Okay. 90, wow. 91. That's a pr um, those are pretty good. You guys were happening then. Yeah, that's a pretty good time to work in a record store. There was a lot going on then. There was, um, there was. Nirvana was about to become the new, like, blow all the yeah. poof heads out of the, <laughs> off of the boulevard. <laughs> that's gonna, I mean, and that's what happened. I mean, you no, had no, some no. I was, coming in. I was, throw, 
there. I was lumped in with the poof heads. Of course, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's no, fair. I, you know, and I don't think that our our lumping in with you know bands like Sugar Ray and okay. you know whomever is okay. fair. Right, you guys and, are. You know, I'm friends with Mark. You know, and but you, uh, you, I mean, that's how I feel. I, so. I feel like Fastball is more of a an organic rock. Uh, band than someone like a Sugar Ray. Yeah, we're, like there's more, uh, more. Yeah, well, we're influenced by real influences that have oh, gone right. long and hard for a long time. Yeah, and you mix, especially Miles and me. Joey kind of goes along with whatever. <laughs> He's like really easy going dude. Well, don't you know, Joey? If you're watching, don't play whatever. Yeah, Joey. If you're watching, don't take offense, but <clears throat> you're the drummer. Yeah, but we're the ones who always, you know, we argue about music and we're the ones who like, you know, go at it like two brothers. And I think that's how Miles is a mainstream dude and he loves, he loved bands like In Excess and Depeche Mode and he loves Tom Petty and Springsteen. I always like really like fucking underground bullshit, but some of it's terrible too. I mean, some of the stuff that I thought I liked, I listen to now and I'm like, what was I thinking? I was just like into something new, you know, I was always into something new. And so, I mean, I liked a lot of weird bands where you'd go and see a band and there's like 10 people. Like I saw REM back in the day oh, man. on a tour and there was 10 people sitting on the floor watching them play. Wow. Three or 84. Wow. But I, so it, I, I know, uh, I think that Tony, I know a, you and Jason, you and Jason have a, a musical history together. Uh, this is going to go. <laughs> I've, I've been in Austin for 25, 26 years. And I remember this being a thing when I when I first arrived. So we're going to this is back in 95, 96, 97. You guys had an ACDC tribute band. Yeah. Tell me, tell me, tell us about the ACDC tribute band that you guys were part of. You first and Jason. Off, first off, I can't, even, bon bon. I, I can't even remember back that far at the, <laughs> right now because it was it was short lived, and uh, I don't even remember how it came together. Do you? Well, we were just forming. Our band was just forming as, uh, you know, the the band that we were to become. Fastball. Yeah. We had a bunch of different names, but. Um, for some reason, I don't know how we got together either, but I think it had something to do with you and Miles. And I know Miles is a huge ACDC fan. And he, he could actually sort of pull off some of that Angus Young stuff. And um, and you were going to do the vocals. And you did the vocals, but you also played rhythm mm -hmm. guitar. So you pulled the Malcolm thing. And you wanted, I know you were very specific about what you wanted. You wanted to have the sound accurate with the two guitars and they had to be played in a specific manner. And I remember I started playing the bass. You handed me your ripper. Oh, yeah. To, <laughs> to, uh, to play the bass. And you handed me this pick made out of metal yeah. with a little piece of duct tape or actually gaffer tape. Yeah. And I still have that. It's, what? I think it's in the store. I'd have to tear the drawer apart, but... I see it all the time and it's this weird pick that you gave me and you're like, you stopped me after like a measure of, of like long way to the top or something like that. And you're like, no, <laughs> you know, it's like downstrokes eight, straight eights, play straight eights on the roof. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> and then the second I'd play anything, you'd go, stop, no. I'm serious. You gotta like. <laughs> it sounds familiar. But about ACDC music that day, and we did it. We played a show, and people were freaking out. Man, they were like, "You were called what? The Bon Bonds?" Yeah, the it bon was all Bon Scott era ACDC. Well, yeah. so, well, I, I, and there was also pre Highway to Hell. I don't think we did anything no, from Highway to Hell. Either. I don't think so. I think we. It was like Powerage and, and yeah. Let there be rock. We yeah. kept it all set mid seventies. I um, I I re I the way I re remember it, uh, Michael Corcoran and maybe uh, Andy Langer and and uh, probably, probably they they came up with the name something. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and and I think that uh, that Wayne Nagel saw that show, and to this day, Jason the Bonbons are right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> totally. always firing me up about yeah. All right, yeah, do the bonbon. Yeah, and yeah. Waldo from the hole in the wall, too. That guy would like Waldo, the guy with the wolves on his cheek. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of the hole in the wall, um, I I kind of glossed over this question earlier, but when when the way was blowing up, you guys were not only all over radio, but you were also doing the late night talk show circuit and you were on all the all the late night TV shows as the musical guest. And uh, I remember sitting watching, I, I want to say it was Jay Leno, and um, he just got the biggest kick out of the fact that you guys made your mark here locally at a club called Hole in the Wall. And he just, he thought the name of the club was hilarious. Right. And um, so I wanted to ask you about the late night talk show circuit. What, I mean, obviously that kind of exposure is amazing, but... Uh, what were the best, what was the most fun show to do? And what's the downside of doing the late night talk show? Well, it's been a long time since I did anything like that. But yeah. uh, I do remember it being really, really kind of fun, especially once you get the, you get the, the drill. I mean, you literally have to show up really early, get uh, they don't really make you up or anything. No, they, you have to go and block out shots. So you do like a little rehearsal thing. And then you might see Conan's over there. He's going through some notes and he's working with the producers on some other aspect of the show while you're working with the sound guy and the camera guys doing your thing over and over. And you have to run it so that they can, you know, block off shots. Um, and then you're, cool, you're free for a little while, you go to lunch, and you get to see all the other people that are on the show, so you're in an elevator with Emmylou Harris or something, or, you know, so I'm, I remember doing Letterman with my mom in, in New York, and like, my mom in, on the elevator, and, and, and Emmylou Harris came in the elevator, and got to talk for, you know, that's, seven that's seconds. Pretty cool. <laughs> that's so pretty that's really awesome. Cool. And, and, and stuff like that, you know, and then you're in the cities, wherever it is, you know, it's either New York or it's Los Angeles. So with Leno, you're in Hollywood and um, there's going to be a killer party afterwards. You know, yeah. once you wrap, which is generally about five o'clock in the afternoon, um, all that stuff is taped in the day. It's a normal day job type thing. And uh, I miss it. I, I got to learn a lot about TV and radio in, in my little time there i mean i've paid attention and it's funny because it's like and jason can relate to this you know you you uh we've been in more hotels than any hotel worker we've been on, on more uh you know on more planes than anybody who works in the airline industry and we've been in more ho um you know radio stations uh, you know radio station employees they would walk us in and then they'd They'd say, go ahead, go ahead. And you don't know where to go because you're walking down a hall. And I always thought that was really funny that, you know, <laughs> you can almost predict the way it is, the drill after a while, you know. And and then, you know, that kind of stuff, we don't do, we didn't, we kind of stopped doing it after our fourth album. Once we got off of Hollywood, we got on a, another label and, you know, it just wasn't that the action wasn't there. The uh, the whole juice thing and having to do all that stuff. Our workload became less. Um, we needed a period after all that too to just figure out what 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 do we want? You know, um, and it's taken us a really long time to come. To, uh, you know, to those realizations. What do we want? We want to make the kind of music that we. Um, love that we can love. Isn't, and, that, isn't that what it's really supposed to be all it, about? It seems like every band would say that too. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. like a generic terminology of a yeah. rock band who who really cares about each other 
and what songs are coming out of the, you know what when you're the band on stage what's coming out of the speakers you, it's not yeah. being a control freak it's it's just it's heart your heart has to be right or and if it's not right and you're just writing a song for somebody else that's it's a little bit different i still have to make those decisions right you know and i'm glad and i feel good about those decisions when i make them and then i you know, I'm not afraid anymore to, right. to, and I feel like I have the skills now to communicate what I want without bumming someone out and hurting their feelings. And if they are hurt, well then, you know, I did my best or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. The fact is the control freak stuff was a big problem because you got these two guys, me and Miles, who had diff very different ideas of what we wanted to do. And Miles was pretty good at articulating what he wanted too, um, and I gotta give it give him that. But I knew I, I wanted something different, and I wasn't able to put my finger on it completely. And um, these days, I know now that we can work together, and we can still we can either write together or we can write separately, and we manage to get what we want. Um, from each other and it hurts a lot less it's still difficult at times I mean we're working currently we're working on new material for the last couple of months we just got out of the studio we did eight songs that are all new brand new originals uh, with Steve Berlin producer extraordinaire um, and uh, that's our second time working with him we did an album that we released in October 2019 um, called The Help Machine. And The Help Machine came out and we were getting ready to go on a giant tour with Everclear, uh, which is funny because we have recently sort of um, reestablished our friendship and our, you know, our whole like, uh, the fact that we toured with them for a lengthy amount of time when we had a hit record and they were the much bigger band and we were the, the upcoming Hit, hit radio band and um, so we've been doing all this stuff um, the pandemic came and kind of uh, put the brakes on that tour so that didn't happen that was going to be a pretty good thing I think because it was actually a redo of our 98 tour it was us Everclear and Marcy Playground and we had all three bands lined up for the tour all the dates all it was all going to happen in June of 2020 and well, we all know what happened. Um, and I took the opportunity to get into my workspace and just start writing, writing, writing and going nuts and learning more production. And I produced a video for a song off of, uh, off of the help machine, which is called uh, white collar. And I worked with a guy, um, socially distanced. We, we, uh, just ran footage to each other. I used my iPhone 11 for stuff that I needed to shoot of me, like singing and playing a guitar, had my son, I, I rigged up the camera and had my son, you know, hit, hit play and stop and cut, you know, and all that. We sent that stuff back and forth and we made a great little video using like action figures and stop motion. <clears throat> it came out pretty cool. It's a weird little thing, but it, it, it works. There's a lot of really cool production like that happening over these weird yeah. times, you know? So people are getting good at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think that I think that there's a lot of uh we're gonna remember good good things and yeah. you know, stay staying positive. That's great. Listen, I want to ask you a uh check your memory here because I don't have much of one either. Uh, the, uh, the show that you guys did that fastball did at the back room. I don't remember if you guys were opening for someone or if it was just like a kickoff show or for a tour or something, but you guys, I think were interviewing producers Oh, and yeah. you, you had a show, so, you know, it was they were going to check you out live. They were going to hear, hear some of the songs of the studio. And you had, I'll just cut to the chase, you guys had Gus Dungeon. Really? You remember that? Um, 
he was with us? Yeah, he was at the sound check at the back room. <laughs> and I walked in because I think it was right around the time that you guys were getting going and you guys were interviewing producers and you had Gus Dungeon there and Miles introduces me to Gus Dungeon there right by the bar in the old back room and I got his autograph. And I, well, I never I think that's something that I wasn't aware of because wow. I think I would have remembered wow. meeting him if even if even like the whole thing. I know that we went eventually we went with Jerry Finn, who right. RIP. Right. But Jerry ended up doing uh he engineered that Dukey record. Oh, and he engineered great. and he engineered and he produced uh a couple of rancid records oh, and see that. uh, offspring. That's freaking awesome. Yeah. yeah. And we actually got, I learned a lot uh, about how he did things and how other producers do things. Look, him coming from a more hard rock um, situation, it was funny. And Miles had so many great stories about this, but like we had Lemmy come in the studio when we were, wait, that's a different record. Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that story in a second. Yeah. But um, w working with Jerry, him and his engineer, his engineer, they were always like, so when are we going to the strip club? <laughs> you know, it's like, they were just like, yeah, after this, we'll go down to the seventh Dale or whatever, you know, <laughs> we don't, we're not really, I mean, I don't mean to appear too nerdy, but we were like really about like, you know, let's make our record. We got to, We'll be in here. Plus, we had A and R guy hanging over our yeah. thing. But the the whole hard rock thing was in place at the studios that we went with, and all those guys had worked with a lot of different people, and they do things a little bit differently than say our more alternative producers have done. Correct. Like we do, we get the drums at NRG, and we did all the drums, and we had about fifty million different drums. We like tried this tom and this snare and all this stuff. And then we finally got all the drums down. And then we, we took everything to another place in the valley. And then it was all about guitars. And it was walls of marshals in a little room, like little cement warehouse room. And just like set the mics up there, do all the guitars there. And then we did vocals in another more cozy studio. And that was it. And then mix it. Get the same dude to mix all our albums yeah. and so, Chris Lord Aldi. This Gus yeah. Dungeon story, I, I there's I just don't remember it. That's okay. There's more than <laughs> one episode of Talk Louder that, that I have brought this Gus Dungeon story up and mentioned you either by name or at least fastball or at least miles. Uh-huh. And, and Gus Dungeon, for people listening who aren't familiar, he's he he produced Elton John's records. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, oh, okay. and I am yeah, I am yeah. this massive Elton John fan. Uh, right, Gus, the, Dude, Rock of the Westies. Yes, Rock of the Westies, and my favorite, oh, okay. my favorite, both of those records are 1975 is Rock of the Westies, and of course, uh, Captain Fantastic, the Brown yeah. Cowboy. Yeah. So when I'm introduced, you know, Miles is like, Jason, this is Gus Dungeon. I'm like, holy crap! And I'm yeah. looking for something. I'm getting his autograph. Right. I had to I have a very I had to dig this out. Theory. This is Gus Dungeon's autograph. What's the date? Is there a date? No, of course not. Of See, course I have a date. feeling that they were auditioning producers for the big car record on Giant. And this would be back in ninety three. Oh different band. Uh that's my ninety ninety one. More like 91. Really? That's Miles and Joey, right? Uh, that's Big, a different, uh, that's before you. That's what you. That's, that's before you, I entered Austin City Limits. I, I don't, I, I, I want to argue that because I just feel like you were there. I can find out and confirm it. Yeah. Well, just, just to, just to make the story. <laughs> okay. Tony's, Tony's going to, Tony's going to ask around and find out if he was I'm there. Sorry. Miles. We don't really edit. <laughs> Just text him real quick. We don't. We, hey, Miles, what year was that you had Gus Dungeon in town? Because we don't really edit for timeline here. So, um, let me talk about this stupid bar napkin. Um, so I'm yeah. sitting there in the back room, and and uh, uh, you know, Miles says, "Jason, this is." Y'all, they're sound checking. I and, and once again, Tony, I think that you're there. I, I could be 
fucking wrong. But, and, and I'm like, holy shit, Gus Dungeon. And I'm, I'm scrambling for a, you know what? You might be right because we, about the timeline, because we like pre Tony, because I said to Gus, I just finished making a record, Dangerous Toys, the second sophomore record with Roy Thomas Baker. Right. Because this, another, yeah, another guy. crazy British guy. Right. So, yeah. so, um, this, the, he signed it. Gus Dungeon signs this. He goes, so you survived working with Roy, huh? Well done, Jason. Best wishes, Gus Dungeon. So I had to dig this out of my Captain Fantastic album. This was framed on the wall in my house. I had, I'm like, look, I have multiple copies of this record because it's just godly to me. Yeah. And, and this, awesome. this napkin was shoved inside of this, <laughs> in, inside of this uh, framed record that I had to peel down to get. And, uh, you know, I went through every copy I had till I found it. Surely it's not the framed one that's hermetically seated on the wall. <laughs> yeah. It was. Okay. Well, that napkin was preserved very well then. Yes. <laughs> right. It looks like I had it had him sign it yesterday. So here's the deal. I'm talking to Gus Dungeon and I'm I'm freaking because, you know, Elton is my my favorite type of songwriting and you know, well, Al, old Alice Cooper and and Elton and Bernie. Oh, they have a lot in common. Bernie Toppin wrote a lot of I, lyrics yeah, for Alice Cooper. Yeah, he did. Uh, From the Inside Record is a collaboration. Go to Hell, too. There's a couple on there. Yeah, and Davy Johnstone from Elton's band played guitar with with uh, Alice quite a bit. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, there's that whole thing. And so I'm like, oh, my God, this is Gus Dungeon. And didn't really – I think I remember telling Gus, you know, uh, man, I like how you put – slapback delay on the toms on like better off dead and songs like that. And he's like, man, no one ever says anything like that. And I said, because I'm a fucking nerd <laughs> yeah, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm just a fan of the, of the songs, but I'm listening to, you know, it's like, man, no drums sound like that. I mean, there's this weird, bah, 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 the slap back on the tongue, right. not flams or, you know, triplets. It's a, it's a slap back, chaka, chaka, you know, the, and I'm like, what the fuck kind of weed like on, uh, to make him want to do that? It's pretty crazy. Yeah, like on uh, um, Bullet in the Gun of Robert Ford, yeah. you know that song? There's like, there's like that kind of Tom. Yeah, yeah. You Better know? Off Dead, you can really hear it on Better Off Dead. Anyway, it's because of, you know, related to you, whether you were there or not. So that yeah. puts it. Puts it <laughs> That <laughs> almost ninety one. We did play at the back room, and but I think it was with some hardcore punk band. Oh, I don't gosh. think it was. And I, I I saw a couple of great shows. I saw Motorhead there play with uh, with um, with Joey Belladonna's uh, yes solo band. I was there. I was there. <laughs> that was a good we show. I was there. Yeah, I met I with that day. Jason at the. Uh, I think it was the um, the Heaven and Hell reunion tour, but it might have been the Monsters or the um, Texas Jam with Scorpions and, uh, and Dio and Megadeth. If you remember, and Leonard Skinner of all bands. Hang on. <laughs> so, hey, so Tony, speaking of Lemmy, I'm looking through. Uh, the liner notes on all the pain money can buy and you thank Lemmy for the advice. What advice did Lemmy give you that you're referring to in the liner notes of this album? Um, so I went home. <laughs> okay. We're done for the day at the studio. We're done. I leave. The next morning I come in with this freaking story of what happened last night. And it's Miles happens to see Lemmy come into the studio today and now. So they invited him in, come on and check out what we're, what we're working on. And he had a song and he put it up and our producer Julian put it up and Lemmy sat and listened to it. And he said, oh, it reminds me of the Ivies. And that band, I guess he was in a band called the Ivies back in the sixties. And Anyway, he said he had a harmony and he wanted to 
So they put the mic up and they set it up and they had let me go into the studio and put up the song and he sang and he sang a a harmony part, which was kind of already there on the record, but you know, he put his little thing on it. And for some reason, um, like he got a photo, Miles got a photo with him and they talked and they probably did give him some good advice or whatever. The advice should have been save the freaking tape with Lemmy on it because we don't know what happened. Uh, we don't know what happened to the tape. So uh, we've never been able to hear it and we can't really get the masters from Hollywood. So it's like so so uh, so so, so just just so just uh, just so I'm clear on this, he actually was in the recording studio and laid down a vocal harmony yeah. on a on a fastball yeah. song. Yeah. On a fastball song. Yes. And fact, it disappeared. I even heard it. I even heard it. <sighs> like the next morning, I heard it being played back. And Lemmy strikes again. Wow. <laughs> Guy went wow. everywhere. It undoubtedly and, happened. I mean, it happened. I just yeah. wasn't there to witness it. No one, no, no one's doubting you. And, <laughs> and Dave can attest to uh, his brilliance in some kind of really strange way, his brilliance and his wisdom and you know he didn't at, he didn't say here's where you can send the check yeah no he Which didn't is, say that no of course not yeah. um he's lemmy and he just appeared how how did he how did he even get invited what was he was hanging around was, at AM. oh okay oh i know why because uh matt sorum was working with uh mike inez at um in the other room and mike was going out with this girl poe who had a record deal and she had like an alternative hit out so soren and inez are there with len and then we're like because i remember there was a weird another weird photo which i can't find of of matt soren holding me like 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 a baby it's really weird it's like Like I'm like a little baby, and um, I never, I never, don't know where that photo is. Weird, but uh, <laughs> that's how that happened. You know, we're wow. in the studio. Come on in, and uh, I didn't know, I didn't know that was going to happen. Well, I remember Poe, and I, yeah, I remember digging the the single, right? And I remember, uh, I may have even seen Poe live. I, I think I saw her live at the at the um, Austin Music Hall. Yeah. I think I saw her on her way up in a smaller yeah. venue, and I, I don't ask me to tell you which one because I don't know. I mean, it could have even been inside at Stubbs or something weird like that. Right. Um, sure. Don't hold me to it, but I think I even I saw I think I saw Poe live at least. Yeah, and One One X was playing. Correct. Shit out of it. Yeah, and they did stuff at Stubbs all the time. Um, yeah. And it shit, it could have been the old emos, you know, something like that. Right. I remember being downtown. Uh, uh, Sorum was in the cult when the toys toured with the cult. Yeah. Uh, so I and I know Sorum toured uh, filling in for Mickey D for Motorhead for a little right. while. So Lemmy right. and, and Sorum are our old Hollywood friendlies. Yeah. So that none of that surprises me and mike inez is he's in there too they're all buddies sure. you know, that makes a lot of sense I actually did some stuff at a and m it was a and m that when um uh, i did uh promo like uh station i radio station ids for that operation rock and roll tour that the toys did with judas priest and alice cooper and motorhead uh -huh. Gnarly. And it was AM that we I'm in there with Rob Halford doing station I that must have been so sick. Watching him through the glass, just uh, yeah, <laughs> just with my <laughs> mouth on the floor kind of thing. <laughs> and then and it was like, you know, it's not supposed to be a big deal, dude. That he's your peer. <laughs> it's like, no, he's the metal god. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. and, and this is after I had gotten off of a tank riding riding a tank down sunset with alice and rob on right. right next to me and the whole time in my mind i'm going i've seen the photo yeah just be cool i'm going be cool <laughs> try to be cool just be cool i just want to man hug both of them you know and i yeah it's 
sure. controlling myself. You know. <laughs> so, so Tony, uh, I always ask this on the show because I'm always interested in, in everyone's response. But what was the what got you hooked on rock and roll initially? Was it was it a particular album? Was it a first concert? Was it uh, your parents' record collection? What first it was? Well, the, I liked the radio, and I got really really into listening to the radio by myself um, when I was maybe nine or 10. So, and it was like KZY in, in Southern California. So it was like basically top 40 AM. So it's like, you know, seasons in the sun. I can, and I can relate to that. Beat, it's a love beat. South and I'm just waiting same. for my favorite songs to come on. And I really, I really liked that weird stuff. Okay. So my thing was I liked weird stuff. So I listened to Dr. Demento and the first records that I ever got, I got them because they were funny because I'm a little kid and I just, I'm in for the gags, man. So I heard of Frank Zappa like really early and I, I liked the Beatles cause they were funny. Like they, they made me laugh. And so the music kind of came in after for me, it was more about jokes. And just like being silly. And so that kind of shaped my thing. But really once I had a friend in fourth grade, once we're 10 and we're in fourth grade and I have a friend who has an older brother who has a record collection. And his record collection consisted mainly of prog music. Yes, Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer, Pink Floyd, Frank Zappa. And I got really into it. And I was already studying music. So I was already a little yeah. classical piano dude. Okay. So that made me like go, hey, this is what I do. I've been trained somewhat to do this stuff. And then the Beatles, the Beatles, the Beatles. After I discovered them, it was like all the way. I knew every song and every word by the Beatles by the time I was 13 years old. I'm sure of it. And but then uh, how do you get in a band was the thing. How do you become in a band? And I was about 14 and I didn't have any. I had an acoustic guitar at home and I had my parents' piano and I had a trumpet because I was in the, the elementary school band and junior high band. So 14, I'm seventh grade, eighth grade. And my friends... My friend has an older brother who has a band and they're all seniors and I'm a freshman. Okay. And we did school to go watch them practice. And they said they were looking for a bass player. And I lied and said I was a bass player and I didn't know I never even touched a bass. And they like, give me the bass. And there's a bass and it's a, it's a Gibson EB. Oh, Ooh, and it's a, yeah. it's like an SG. It's a bitching bass, right? Wow. And I have photos of this stuff, and I post it occasionally on my Facebook. But it's me, and they used to call me Space Monkey, and I had I had long hair, and I was a tiny little guy with a giant bass, and I played with a pick, and we played Jumping Jack Flash. We played Break or not Breaking the Law because that wasn't even out yet, but we played a uh, um, Born to Be Wild and we played jump, uh, so Stones, um, you know, we played Credence, played shit like that. And then uh, we played God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols. Yeah. And this is literally summer of 78. So the record is like a current record. And there's a guy in our band. So no one knows how to be punk yet. They have no idea. There are, we all had long hair. Hair, except we had this guy in our band who was into like you know glitter rock and the sweet and he was into like you know alice cooper and later he was in a band called cooper mania this guy jeff colgan he wore his girlfriend's pants and he had long bleach blonde hair with bangs and that stuck up and they his hair stuck up stuck up on the top and it went down like that and it looked like he could have been in sweet right yeah and um or alice cooper band i think they call like that. that like a priscilla yeah it was like a full-on <laughs> priscilla yeah they yeah they, 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 and, like a beehive. I, I spent the next five years trying to figure out how to make my hair do that and i would ruin my hair constantly i'd grow my hair and ruin it 
and have to cut it. And like it, it was a nightmare. So finally, I just gave up, and I'm like, "Hey, punk!" So we just cut off the hair. No worry about that. And it was still this hard music. And you know what? I was. I thought I was into that. You know, for and I was. I mean, I was totally into whatever was fresh and new. But by the time that all my friends down the street stopped beating me up and started being punk themselves. Um, I was on to something new. I was in the, I started getting into like more of an Americana thing. And I was into like, like uh, Los Lobos and, and the Blasters and the Stray Cats. And I started getting into more country and, and more, uh, you know, just stuff that I felt I could actually play, you know, and write and, you know, and just, and then I had a big break of not doing anything because I, I was all fucked up on drugs. So by the time I was like 19 till I was 23, I had a really bad drug problem. And so I got cleaned up. And then next thing I knew, uh, music was the thing. It was like the full force that kept me like going. And it, it really, it stuck a fire under my ass so hard. And I knew I never wanted to you know, get to where I was again, you know, like that. And so I started playing and I ended up being in a band with, uh, with Jack Grisham from TSOL. And it was a more metal kind of band called Tender Fury. And we had a deal with some record company and looking for management. And we, we did a bunch of shows and it was really fun. It was like a, it was like a metal band. So we would play it at, um, at the cat house or we play at the Roxy and we play at, so we play with bands like Bang Tango and and Motorcycle Boy and and yeah like uh you know Junkyard they were part of that scene too yeah. and um, I remember one time not to like jump in here and mess up your no, no. that was all awesome that that was awesome story it's like you no. never would know that about me I, if I, I remember didn't. you yeah, I remember yeah. you telling me upon one of our earliest meetings that that you were you were you you this is i recall this this sentence coming out of your brain it, you said yeah i was out the toys you know when all that was going on i was out there i was doing that when yeah. when you got when we you were. were doing it i was doing the same thing i remember you all saying the girls that. i liked were into that scene they were going yeah. to hollywood they were all about the cult they were all about um the guns and roses thing was about to like blow up when i got clean and yeah. it did that whole time 88 was, you know, yeah. KNAC was playing Appetite. Yeah. And it took months. I remember because the radio would play them all the time and still nothing. It just, the ice wouldn't break. And then finally, and they were just the biggest thing in the world. Yeah. And, you know, another two years of that. And then the next biggest thing in the world came, Nirvana came. Right. And, then, you know, so then everything became Lollapalooza and everything became alternative rock and modern rock radio and so that's why you know when dave says we got a uh, number one record on the american charts he's right in a way but the fact is it wasn't the top 100 it wasn't the pop charts it wasn't the rock charts it was the modern rock charts wow. but by 1998 the modern rock chart was all that mattered right For about five years that's all anybody cared about Wow. And it's because of Nirvana and then it's because of Green Day and then it's because of Rancid and right. You yeah. know, and that's just the way things were. and then PJ Harvey and then the Pixies and then next thing you know, Smashing Pumpkins and you got this whole alt nation and then yeah, you know, and things and all that stuff's gone. It's yeah. all gone. Everything's gone. Yeah. And everything we do now is just us doing what we've always loved to do and we do it and dude i gotta say one more time the igniter record that's my jam that is the sound that i was telling you my aesthetic got kind of stuck around 78 79 yeah you know and you like nailed every, almost all the biggies of that that that's time kind of, yeah i i uh to interject your your Sort of, I call it a review of the record, the Golden Age of Black Magic. 
uh, reviewed by Tony Scalzo. Oh, yeah. Fastball. <laughs> you know, yeah. you weren't trying. I was on a cup of cups of coffee. Yeah, you were not reviewing the record, but you were reviewing the record. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I turned it into a review and reposted it and shared it with the band Niner, and their minds were blown. They were just like, "What?" And I'm like, yeah. yeah. Did you see the the photo surface of you hanging out with your bros wearing the igniter cap? It ended up on the uh, pat oh, yeah. igniter. Like, found the photo of you wearing the igniter hat. Yeah, and I was wearing it in the studio actually when we were at the studio just a couple of weeks. Had to have been had to have been what it was, and it was. Yeah. It uh, Pat saw it online somewhere. Thanks for the hat, by the way. <laughs> no problem. Reposted it somewhere on the Igniter Facebook or something. Good deal. Like, That's what it's all about. And I want to promote the Leche House too, down in Buda. Nice. I so Martinez from Brownout. Oh, okay. Uh, nice. Also, he's a huge hard rock. Uh, he's got he's got a bunch of you know Brownout posters and and um, and. Uh, Group of Phantasma stuff, but he's also got a giant Slayer poster on the wall too. And so, and you know, they had the Brown Sabbath thing, that project. Yes. Where they did all the, all the, I think they did the whole Paranoid album. Wow. But they did like Spanish, Espanol, and and, it was badass. Do they, I haven't actually heard that. Are they doing it like Latin rock style or are they doing Sabbath style? Yeah, but with, you know, with pretty killer rock guitar. And, oh, good. And so it's kind of like a hybrid. Yeah. Um, and that was about four or five years ago. Yeah, I've seen some of the, at School of Rock, there was, there was more than one kid show up with a Brown Sabbath t-shirt. And I'm like, what? Yeah, that's oh. cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> you want to see like a 12-year-old walk up wearing a Brown Sabbath t-shirt. <laughs> Do you even know what that is? Do you know what that's a play on, you know? It's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. I mean, uh, I love projects like that. And I think people should do more crazy shit like that. Well, now that we know like your earliest beginnings, uh, you were looking for funny stuff and Dr. Demento said, you know, that's, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Watch out where the Huskies go, man. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I remember having some of that stuff on cassette tape, uh, disco duck and all that stuff around the same time frame. I love novelty records. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the term. Yeah, uh, Tony, I wanted to ask you one more uh, thing. Um, you know, th- again, I, I hate to keep harping on that on your your smash hit "The Way," but it, it's so phenomenal to me that somebody I know has a song that was so ubiquitous. I guess is the word it, for such a period of time. Hold on, I so, gotta look up that word. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's there. All that everywhere you look. Yeah, it was everywhere all the time, 24-7. Um, <laughs> so for you, it, Jason and I were talking about this the other day when we knew we were going to have you on the show, and I was going to let him ask the question, but I'm, I'm going to jump ahead. Um, we were we were wondering if you ever get a kick out of uh, where's the weirdest place you've been when you hear your song come over the PA system, like is at a grocery store, a doctor's office, an elevator, or I mean, is there any time that you've heard the way and you just went, Oh my God, it's here too. <laughs> um, back in the day when it was on the radio all the time, um, I was walking through the streets of Milan, Italy, and just hanging out looking for some, and, uh, I heard this, uh, I heard the song coming through some PA and I turned the corner and it's a guy by himself at a bar. And I started jumping up and down and yelling at the guy and in English. I don't speak Italian. I'm Italian, but I don't, I don't speak it. And uh, I tried to tell him that, you know, that's me. And I'm like, do you have the CD? Do you have the CD? And he like picks up the CD and I go, that's me. <laughs> and I go like that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I, I thought that was weird. And yeah, I've been in the grocery store a couple of times, but the best thing is when you're with your kids in the oh, store. Yeah. And they, they go, oh, right. He's oh, <laughs> like, yeah. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Dude. Yeah. I didn't even awesome. think about that, but man, that just touched my yeah, heart. I bet that's a, that's a, you skip a beat, right? Yeah, for sure. I, um, wow. I've been, uh, 
if, if I can count them, I can't count them on one hand how many times I've been in HEB, you know, the getting pick, getting milk and eggs and, and the way it yeah. goes on. So, yeah, that makes I me mean, smile. It, may, it still makes me smile. Just go, that's right, yeah. man. I hear fire escape quite often too. And yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and I got real lucky a couple of years back because Machine Gun Kelly and Camilla Cabello made a made a record called Bad Things where they literally used the chorus from out of my head for the record. And my publisher sent me an email with the MP3 attached and was going, these people already have it recorded. They're going to drop it in a couple of months. They just want to know if, if you're cool, can they go ahead? And I said, I said, yeah, what do I have to do? It sounds like a hit. It sounds like a hit to me. That's what I said. Wow. Good. And it, you guys just say yes or no. And I said, yeah. And um, I managed to, uh, you know, get like 50% writer credit oh, for the song. Yeah. And there's five other writers on the song. Yeah. And the thing went to number one <laughs> for so they, three weeks. They, what's the name uh, of the song? And that was 2017. What was, what's the name of the song? It's called Bad Things by Bad Machine Gun Kelly. Yeah. Wow. And, and they who, who just most recently played... Uh, um, Tommy Lee, Lee in the in the yeah yeah in the, the dirt. Dirt. right yeah. yeah okay yeah, yeah. we 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 know who Machine Gun Kelly is um, you know I don't know if I'm a fan or not right I mean, uh, it's you know, his music's interesting but I you know I'm just you know give me Van Halen anyway so you know sure. you, yeah you think like uh, he's 28 years old God that's unreal so his big influence is like Blink 182. Yeah, exactly. Sure, I mean, sure. you know, that's yeah. he's, a, he's a hard, a heavy guy, but you know, he doesn't really have the background that we're gonna have. Right, so right. we're gonna. Well, have, he's a rock and roll guy, and I have to, I have to. Yeah, sure Appreciate Definitely. that. I have to appreciate that that he's a rock and roll guy. He he's kind of like an '80s throwback. Well, you've met Tommy Lee, right? No. Oh well, I've met Nick, let me but, tell you. Hey, what? <laughs> Let me tell you, he nailed Tommy Lee. He's yeah. like, especially during that time. I mean, yeah. it was like spot on. Right on. So you've you've like, met you've met Tommy Lee, Tony. Back in, you know, back in the eighty in the eighty nine, eighty. Yeah. 80, do you, feel do you have any? Do you have any crazy Tommy Lee, Tony Scalzo no, stories? I, I, I so let know. me let me finish <laughs> let me finish my thought. So this song, "Bad Things," Machine Gun Kelly. Right. What part of your song and what song? Are you talking about the way? No, out of my head. What, out, uh, out, out of my head. head. So they took the chorus and put it in mm -hmm. his song or just the chord progression or what? Just the chorus and yeah, the chord prediction, the chord progression of the chorus. And then it, it kind of sandwiches these little rap segments. Okay. You know? Okay. Cool. So it's a hip hop song. Right. So it samples. No, no samples. Oh, okay. No, um, the producers of the record are these guys called the. Uh, oh shit, man! No, I blown it. I was doing so well. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> they have a name. These guys, this production team, and they've done a lot of records with a bunch of different people. Right. And so they um, re-recorded. They recorded their song, and you know, basically made space you know, for other bits. Yeah. But they wanted to use it so bad in the chorus and the out of my head thing that they um, saw fit to call my publisher. Wow. And, well, the, and the ask for permission. That, so the, it was like, a, it was just a gift, such a like uh, amazing gift that, yeah. you know, and you know what? You get more money these days than you used to. Yeah. So th that's, that's yeah. what I wanted <laughs> That's what I wanted to ask. And, and, you know, if some of this is off the record, then that's fine. But I, I just kind of wanted to understand when you have a hit that was as massive as The Way, a lot of people just assume that the money starts rolling in and it lands in your pocket. And and we all know that's not true. But I, I want to. Quite a few pockets. Yeah. That didn't belong I, to me. I want to believe that, you know, when a song is that big, you at least. Uh, you know, you, you, you made a little money off it for a period of time. And I would guess you probably still make 
money off it if it's used in a movie or anything like that? Right. Well, you get, you still get this income. It dwindles down to a, a fraction of what it once was. Yeah. But you still get this residual income. You get your ASCAP payments, you yeah. know, and then those payments go up when you have another hit and it turns into this other thing. And also, we're starting to feel a little bit better about, you know, like the streaming stuff, Spotify, Apple Tunes and, and all that stuff is starting to pay more. And we're starting to realize also that unlike hard copy sales of records, and this could be my imagination, but it seems to me those numbers stay steadier on streaming. Whereas if you sell a bunch of records, you get this thing and then eventually it yeah, stops. I could see right. I could see how you would think that that the activity on your record is right. in digital land it's yeah. going to be a straighter line. It seems like actually the, you, what you're trying to go for too is the monthly listeners on your Spotify. And you need to get that to, well, our goal, like our goal now is to get to a million. And we're like at 880,000 wow. a month. And that's pretty wow. good. For yeah. a band like that. And Who, this is, and this I mean, is what, what material? We know that we're around still. I mean, we're yeah. struggling to, to appear current. And um, Hold on. Struggling to appear current. <laughs> Yeah. In my new book <laughs> called Struggling to <laughs> I mean, I know it's possible. And yeah. let's take a look at the career of Willie Nelson. You know, I mean, shit. Yeah. I was in his 40s before, you know, he really became a superstar. And yeah. now he's more famous than ever. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, and I'm not looking to be, I just want, I just want to be able to fill some theaters and go out and play before it's too late. Yeah. I want to fill thousand seat theaters. I don't think it's too much to ask for our band. We yeah. can't do that right now. Right. I want it to happen. So that's a good goal. And I'm going to work on that. And we're going to, we're coming out with a bunch of really good new material. And we're also going in the studio next week to do a bunch of covers that we've never done. We've never actually recorded like covers for release and, we're doing, and it's turning out to be different than I ever thought it was going to be. And mm. uh, I think the, a lot of the fans who have been calling out songs that we should we should be um, recording are going to be disappointed because it's like I'm like, man, no, no, uh, uh-uh, uh, we're not going to do that. I mean, people want us to do, uh, they want us to do Elvis Costello songs, they want us to do uh, Beatles songs, they want us to do Badfinger. Um, they want us to do Nick Lowe, Squeeze. And I'm like, dude, that is like such low-hanging fruit. And why would I try to improve that stuff? I'd rather take somebody's song and then do it in a different way and, you know, do something creative instead of just, you know, bashing out a cover like some band playing at, you know, Hanover's or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean... There's enough, I'm getting a little sick of it, and I have friends who do it, but I got to say, man, enough with the freaking tributes. Right. Enough with, the, you know, all of that. And the cover bands, that's what people want because that's all they think they're going to get. And if you let people know that there's original music and there's people who are going to write some kick-ass new stuff for their generation, they'll love it, but they just don't. People are... Everywhere I look on the internet, it's like their new EP with covers by blah, you know, and it's yeah. covers. It's like, dude, you're an artist. Yeah. Yeah. You're an yeah. artist. Yeah. Don't yeah. give, um, you know, art. What is the word? Counterfeiter. Right. Yeah. <laughs> either, either way. And I feel like I should say something coming from someone who is in a bunch of tri- and we were in a tribute band but i mean you know <laughs> but i together, but you know that was yeah. then yeah it's it's a so lot of fun. Needed that it's then. a lot of fun to just uh you know recreate 
but it's also better for your soul to create. And yeah, I really I feel like uh, you're, you have a lot of strength and I feel like you have some goals that are entirely reachable. And I, I just really appreciate uh, everything that you do and say uh, with your voice and your, the music that you write, Tony. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll echo that. Uh, we appreciate you being on the show today. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that you're still hungry and you do have goals that seem reasonable and attainable. And I, and I hope you reach those. And, uh, again, just congratulations on the massive success that you had with that, with the song, the way back in 1998, I know it seems like a lifetime ago, but that song will live forever, man. And, uh, not right. a lot of people, not a lot of people get to say that, dude. So uh, very fortunate. And it's it's a good thing that it still helps us today. Yeah. Our, yeah. our, our catalog of hits, there's really four hits. And we we play them in every set. A lot of uh, there's so we many never people. Leave them out. <laughs> there's so many people in, in the world that, you know, would love to make their mark in a creative way. And um <laughs> Uh, you guys, the two of you have actually done it. And uh, in the case of Tony, you know, the the way was just, you know, everywhere for, for so long. So hats off to you, man. And Thank thanks you. for joining us today. We appreciate it. It's been a blast. Thank, Thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Scalzo joining us today from Fastball on the Talk Louder podcast. I'm Metal Dave Glessner, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster, signing off for this time. We will see you next time on Talk Louder.